to this meeting and my talk today is about graphene and is it actually stronger than steel so on this slide uh, you can see the structure of uh, graphene uh, which is not very different actually from carbon nanotubes so you know you can imagine that a carbon nanotube is basically a folded over sheet of graphene so the properties of carbon nanotubes are very similar to those of graphene apart from the fact that graphene is a, essentially a monolayer of atoms and the structure of graphene which is illustrated on the right hand side uh, is basically a hexagonal arrangement of atoms with a hexagonal unit cell and two atoms per lattice point so it's not a primitive structure um, which is uh, hexagonal with an angle of 120 degrees and there's a motif of two carbon atoms for every lattice point of that cell so it's not a primitive structure and i mentioned earlier that basically carbon nanotubes and graphene are very similar except for the dimensions so the strength of a carbon nanotube actually is not different from that of a sheet of graphene it's about 130 gigapascals strong and that's why people have been saying uh, a lot that um, you know graphene is stronger than steel and i want to today analyze that question a bit more uh, so this is a crystal of graphene uh, approximately 200 micrometers in size and you can see the beautiful uh, hexagonal symmetry of the crystal here and you can even see that it's a uh, it's dendritic growth because uh, this is actually deposited by chemical vapor deposition and you know at this small size you can make uh, crystals but if they are larger than this you generally get a polycrystalline um, arrangement of um, uh, graphene crystals in the sheet so most graphene sheets are polycrystalline and will contain grain boundaries i think we need to do something about this um, because it's uh, okay now this is a, a slide uh, which i took today from the university of manchester's website uh, and it says you know graphene is the wonder material that is one atom thick and 200 times stronger than steel so i've just taken this today from manchester university's website and this statement is being used in order to recruit students to excite students uh, i'm going to show you that this is not a good way of exciting students because this statement is not actually correct so uh, the question is has graphene delivered a strong material uh, even if uh, we are talking about the strength of graphene in isolation not comparing with steels and are we forgetting a very elementary law that exists in materials that when you scale the dimensions of the product the properties change especially when you're dealing with small dimensions so these are the crystal structures the common crystal structures of iron uh, you see here a body centered cubic cell which is that of ferrite and a face centered cubic cell which is that of austenite and what i want to know is what is this ideal strength of this material that means the strength without defects because it's defects that degrade the strength of metals when uh, you change them from an absolutely perfect crystal to a crystal containing defects well you can do a calculation in which you take a body centered cubic unit cell of ferrite and you pull it in these two directions uh, so that it becomes more and more tetragonal but you are pulling it along its weakest direction that is the 100 direction and then you'll find that you know the strength goes up to something of the order of 15 gigapascals and then starts to drop again and the reason for this drop is that by the time you have stretched it enough you basically reproduce austenite 
So this is the body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite, which is produced by distorting the body-centered cubic cell. So there's nothing unusual about this. Here we are measuring the strength of ferrite, and here we are measuring the strength of austenite as we pull it. So the theoretical strength of iron is about 15 gigapascals. And here, here you have 14.5 gigapascals, and this is when we pull it along its weakest direction, which is the 100 direction. But let's assume that this is the highest strength. Well, in 1956, these experiments were reported where we have already achieved the theoretical strength of iron. Here you can see it's almost 15 gigapascals, uh, and these are single crystals of iron. Uh, and the size of the single crystals is plotted on the horizontal axis. And this is a stress strain curve, which shows that, you know, we are reaching stresses so large that it's no longer obeying the normal laws of elasticity. That means stress is no longer proportional to strain, even though it is an elastic strain. Now, the spectacular thing about this, which was known in 1956, is that as you increase the size of the crystal, the strength collapses, okay? And the reason for this is very well known that a small crystal can have perfection. That means it can be free from defects. And therefore, when you pull it, you either have to create defects or you cleave the crystal. So as your crystal becomes larger and larger, the probability of finding defects increases. And this is the basic reason why when you increase the size, uh, the strength collapses. But of course, uh, most of the materials that we deal with are not single crystals. They are polycrystalline materials. And we can achieve strength by deforming them. And the metallic bond is so fantastic that when you actually slide atoms over top of, uh, on top of each other, you don't break the bonds. Okay, you just relocate the atoms. The bonding remains exactly the same. That's not true, for example, for a covalent bond where you break it, it's broken. You can't reform it. So metals can, uh, layers of atoms can slide over each other without destroying the metallic bond. And we can take advantage of that by deforming a material, we can introduce a lot more defects and those defects add to strength. So here, for example, is an atom probe image of a steel which has been deformed very severely. So if you take 50 grams of steel and you stretch it out into five kilometers of fiber, uh, this is what it will look like on an atomic scale. And here you can see the very severely deformed uh, cell boundaries, which are full of dislocations. But the size of the cells is very, very small, and that means the strength is enormous. So this is a commercially available material, and it's no longer size sensitive because we are now relying on the presence of defects inside the microstructure. Whereas when we talk about single crystals or when we rely on perfection to achieve strength, the strength is very sensitive to size. So all of this information is completely established. So now let's uh, go back to the carbon and uh, this is the story from uh, the year 2000, when carbon nanotubes were the big subject. And, you know, the strength along the axis is about 130 gigapascals. So this uh, article is actually published in Actra Astronautica because people were thinking about making a space elevator with a rope, which is uh, something like uh, 30,000 miles long. And the modulus along the axis is 1.2 terapascals, which is about six times that of steel. So these are numbers, you know, which are made in our dreams. They are very, very strong and extremely stiff along a particular direction. There is one uh, problem with how the strength is defined, is that when you take this tube, uh, you do not count the material inside the tube. Whereas when we test a bit of metal, we take the entire cross section. So if we looked at uh, the strength of a steel in the same way, then we would increase it by 47% compared with um, uh, the normal way in which we measure the strength. 
So, you know, the ideal strength would suddenly become from 15 gigapascals, it would become something like 20 gigapascals. But let's let's forget about the way strength is defined. They only look at the thickness of the tube in calculating the strength. Same, exactly the same thing happens with carbon nanotubes as with the iron whiskers, the single crystals, which were studied back in 1956 is that as soon as you start, start to scale the length, the strength collapses, okay? And there is a very, very beautiful explanation for this, which we teach to first year undergraduates. So if you look at the energy of a defect, okay, that opposes the creation of a defect. Small n is the number of defects. But there is another term in thermodynamics which favors the formation of the defect. So if you have an arrangement of atoms and you pull one atom out to leave a vacancy, then there are many, many locations at which you could put that vacancy. So the configurational entropy increases dramatically, and therefore that favors the formation of the defect because nature likes to have uh, defects. So if I differentiate this equation with respect to the number of defects, then I will get an equilibrium number of defects. That means the defects will be there no matter how good your manufacturing process is, okay? This is a thermodynamic function, and that means at equilibrium, you will have a certain number of defects, and that is exactly the reason why we are able to diffuse atoms through metals, because there are vacancies inside the metal, no matter how perfectly you make the material. So here you can see that the strength of a nanotube rope collapses as soon as you know its size increases to two millimeter and there's absolutely no hope of using carbon as a material to make a space elevator so this is the elementary concept that all the people working on very small objects have completely forgotten but it is an extremely well established principle okay this is how the strength of uh, uh, film, uh, a, carb, a graphene film is measured. So you put an indenter onto the film uh, and it's, it's to the credit of these authors that they mentioned that the graphene is a perfect sample of graphene without defects. And you can only make a perfect sample if it is very small. And here you can see that it's a two micrometer square uh, sample. And of course, the strength came out to be 130 gigapascals because the way in which it's calculated is you work up some mechanics and then you divide by the thickness of a monolayer of graphene and you come up with 130 gigapascals. Absolutely not surprising because carbon nanotubes have a strength of 130 gigapascals when you pull them along the axis. So graphene is not the strongest material in the world. Carbon nanotubes came before graphene. And now if I take this number of 130 gigapascals and I divide it by the theoretical strength of steel uh, of the same size, that means uh, two micrometer square, then you show that graphene is actually nine times stronger than steel when you compare at the same size, okay? So it's completely wrong to claim that it is hundreds of times stronger than steel. Uh, you, when you're dealing with small objects, you have to take account of the size of the object that you're interested in. Now, I mentioned the metallic bond earlier, and you know, even when you deform a material, you don't destroy the metallic bond. The metal atoms stay together, and that is an outstanding mechanism by which metals can absorb energy which covalent materials cannot because as soon as you break them, the bonds are gone and recover completely elastically. So there's no significant plastic energy stored inside a covalent material. And this is the reason why graphene is actually a brittle material. As soon as it fails, you basically get a collapse with almost no energy absorbed in the process. This is, this is brittle failure. And here's another example where, you know, almost everything here is elastic deformation and you get brittle failure. Now, you would not make something on which 
you know, your life depends. If the material is not capable of absorbing energy during fracture, because that is the whole basis of safe design. When you're traveling in a car and you hit another car, there will be sophisticated systems which absorb the energy by the deformation of your car. And that saves the person in the compartment of the car. So graphene is actually a brittle material when you apply a, a tensile stress. So going back to the size effect, uh, many years ago, people started to look at the deformation of microscopic pillars, which you make using focused ion beam machining. So here is an example of a pillar, which has a size of a few uh, micrometers. And then you can put this in the scanning electron microscope and deform it. So this is, this could be a single crystal, in which case when you deform it, you know, you might get a very high strength if the probability of finding defects inside this is small. And uh, the Du and Darby produced this uh, plot for a number of materials, gold, nickel, copper, and aluminum, which they call the scaling law. So here, uh, the shear stress is being plotted against uh, the normalized shear stress. It's normalized with respect to the shear modulus, plotted against the dimension divided by the Burgers vector uh, of uh, dislocations in each of these materials. And you can see the data fall on this, on this straight line on a log, log plot, and they call this the scaling law. In other words, even with uh, metals, uh, other metals than iron, when you do pillardas, the strength that you measure scales with the pillar diameter according to this function. Now, I put together data for iron single crystals and for carbon. And again, this is a log log plot. And you can see that the strength of carbon nanotubes would continue to collapse as you make the size bigger. And the same applies to the ions in crystals. Here I'm dividing the strength by the Young's modulus instead of the shear modulus. And uh, the size is not uh, dimensionless here. So um, the same sort of scaling behavior applies to carbon nanotubes and ion single crystals. The wonderful thing is that with a metal, when you make it polycrystalline, you can achieve strengths which are enormous. You know, easily achieve two gigapascals, and you can buy commercial materials where the strength is three and a half gigapascals. And I will show you that it isn't, you cannot design an object on the basis of strength alone. We have to have a basket of properties before you use the material uh, to manufacture something. So, you know, when you report a new material which has a high strength, that doesn't mean that it is useful strength. Now, people have been talking about putting graphene in composites. Uh, so let's assume that you've got perfect graphene, which has a strength of 130 gigapascals, and you put it inside a polymer. There is no possibility of transferring stress onto that particle of graphene. You will not be able to exploit the strength of graphene because the plastic will simply deform. Uh, and the graphene will not. So we know this from, for example, trip steels, which are a mixture of martensite and ferrite, that the martensite begins to deform when the stress reaches an appropriate level. And there's no way in a polymer you can reach the strength of 130 gigapascals. So adding graphene to polymers doesn't lead to any impressive properties. So, you know, here we are just going from zero to 50 and uh, megapascals and you know, the strain for a polymer is large. So these are not at all impressive properties. And frankly speaking, this could have been predicted because people also added carbon nanotubes to polymers to make composite and it fails because you cannot transfer stress across the interface. Okay, so this uh, brings me um, to an important point. So we have, I mentioned to you that we have commercial steels with a strength of three and a half gigapascals. So why don't we use them to make this pipeline or to make this uh, component of a crane or even this wire, steel wire? 
which are all less than three and a half gigapascals. The reason is very clear. This is actually a pipeline being lay, laid in China. The pipeline, uh, I will show you, has to have a certain level of toughness, which will stop a ductile crack from propagating at a very high speed all along the length of the pipeline. Okay. Uh, this is a martensitic steel, and it has to be joined at some stage, and so does the pipeline. These are these are actually wells. And of course, uh, the wire has achieved its strength by deformation, and it does not require toughness because you can have many filaments together. And you know, if a few filaments fail, the uh, rope is still safe. So this this is the uh, uh, point uh, I was making that you know the pipe is generated by welding together pieces. These are actually welding stations. The the joining of the pipes is done obviously on site. Now you can't weld something that is you know three giga, giga pascal strong. Uh, Hong Biao Long uh, Hong, Hong Biao Dong will tell you that. Okay, uh, so the pipe has to have a strength which is of the order of five or six hundred megapascals because it has to be welded. So you never have a component which relies on just a single property. And this is what happens when you get your toughness wrong. Uh, so these are pressure tests done on pipes. And this is a picture I took at the TWI where you can see a burst. Now, the plastic zone associated with this crack is actually of the order of uh, a meter or so. Okay. And that's a good thing. But if the pressure is high enough, that crack will propagate a very long distance. And imagine that you're transmitting fuel by this, then you will cause a lot of pollution. So you cannot just rely on one property. And you cannot exploit very high strength. So let's assume that we can make a material which is big. And it has 130 gigapascals. And the modulus is 1.2 terapascals. Uh, and that you stress it to this level then the amount of energy that's stored inside your material is greater than that in dynamite. And the propagation velocity is much greater than in dynamite because of this high modulus. That means that if you make an elevator using a carbon nanotube rope, and for some reason or another it breaks, it will break explosively with a detonation velocity which is greater than that of dynamite. So my advice is, you know, try and be sensible about the use of strength. So my conclusions are very simple. Uh, graphene is at best 10 times stronger than steel, but only at the micrometer level. So we should not be telling uh, students who are applying to university that, you know, we have invented graphene, which is 200 times stronger than steel. Any student who hears that should not go to that university. There is also no evidence that the strength of graphene is maintained as the size is increased. And graphene is a brittle material because it is covalently bonded. It's the carbon-carbon bond which gives it the strength at a small size. So it can only be stressed elastically. Uh, if you fail, you're just breaking the bonds. Uh, there's not a significant absorption of energy. Now I'd like to end with a final slide which I like very much. So this is a, a translation of my book on bainite in steels, uh, kindly translated by my colleagues at Yanshan University and it should be available in the very near future. So I'll stop that, uh, stop uh, my lecture now. I've finished uh, in 24 minutes but that's